So how would you describe King's Quest VII to someone who's never played it? I would say it is my favorite game of all time. It still makes me tear up a little bit every time I, I play the game. The desert, the forest, the dark land, it's like a magical journey. So I hated this game when I first played it casually. I thought it was stupid. This is like a Disney movie. Like, uh, this is like for little babies. I was like, what is this? Everything looks like, you know, a smiley Land Before Time cartoon. Man, it's my favorite King's Quest game to run now. More than five, more than six. I love running seven so far and beyond the other games. It's crazy. What makes this a great speed run? How did the runners bring the time down? And why is King's Quest seven the speed run that makes you sing? Originally released in 1994, King's Quest VII was a vast departure from the earlier games. If it wasn't titled King's Quest, I wouldn't have thought it was a King's Quest game. It's so unlike the others. It's the only King's Quest that has like a Disney-esque full cell shading and went through many different animation studios. Even though there's not many frames of animation, the ones that are there are, are fantastic and immaculate. And they very much simplify the user interface in that you only have your left mouse button click and your mouse cursor just sparkles. There's inventory object puzzles and stuff like that, but it's all very kind of gone back to basics. The game even auto saves just before you die, a first for the series. It's so much more forgiving in like every aspect. The game opens with Princess Rosella lamenting the pressures of growing up. She doesn't want to be tied down in marriage and wants adventure instead. When her mother, Queen Valenice, starts talking about a potential suitor, Rosella becomes distracted by a vision in the pond. So Rosella does the logical thing and jumps in. Valenice jumps after her, but the two become separated. The game then alternates between Valenice and Rosella over the course of six chapters. In addition to finding each other, the two need to defeat the evil sorceress, Malicia. Malicia's grand plan is to destroy the land of Etheria by making a volcano erupt. In the end, good triumphs, and Rosella lives happily ever after. The credits roll over arguably the best song in the King's Quest franchise, A Land Beyond Dreams. Grow up, young lady, that's what they all say. If I had to describe the game in one word, it would be whimsical. There's a lot of stuff crammed in here, and not all of it is logical, but it is memorable. A perfect example is this kangaroo rat, who will trade items with you, but only if they rhyme. Would you like to trade with me? You won't believe what you will see. It was so funny, like all the things that they would come up with, they'd have like all these ridiculous things and you'd always be like, no, like that doesn't really sound very good or whatever. Pretty piece of silky cloth. Yeah. I'll go get my best dead moth. And then, yeah, a crook for a book. Oh, of course, yeah, why wouldn't I need a crook, obviously. Now that sounds like a good trade. A wild game. It, none of it makes sense, and I guess that's okay. The first speedrun that I could find was technically done by Shady Paradox. However, this was a segmented run and wasn't submitted to speedrun.com. The website didn't even exist when the video was created. So it wasn't surprising that in 2017, Jam Evil would not be aware of its existence. Jam had been a longtime fan of the series ever since he was a child. I couldn't figure out puzzles. I was, what, eight years old playing, and, and I wasn't even allowed to play at the PC at the time. I had to break in from Packard Bell Kids Space into Microsoft Windows 3.1 just to play the game without my parents knowing uh, about it. So <laughs> I used to bring the book the King's Quest Seven authorized handbook into school, read the book, and go home and be like, I know exactly what I'm doing now. I started speedrunning seriously back in like 2014, 2015. I didn't really do too much before then. And I kind of started speedrunning with like Zelda and Zelda Randomizer, Zelda One, Any Percent. I'm like looking at different projects on speedrun.com and I'm like, boy, I love King's Quest Seven. I wonder if there's any speedruns of King's Quest Seven. There is a leaderboard for it with only one run on it by Cursed Dolls. And it was a Windows version of the game. It was the slowest speed run I think I've ever seen in my entire life because the game just ran natively slow in Windows. As you might be able to guess, the game runs faster in DOS. I loaded it up, 
I tested it out and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if this game could go any faster. Read through the documentation and saw that if you hit the plus button, it speeds up the movement speed, the animations, pretty much everything. And I was like, well, I wonder how far this could go. The original release ran at a consistent and slow speed, but version 2.0 added speed controls. This isn't mentioned anywhere in the game interface. Uh, I also couldn't find a manual from the time that mentioned this either. The documentation Jam is talking about is from the King's Quest collection, released in 1997. That in and of itself, that discovery was enough to make me want to take the game seriously. Holding down the plus key had another small advantage. There's a fast forward button during the cutscenes. If you move the mouse down to that while you're holding it, it just does it first frame. Jam also found that left clicking and right clicking at the same time made the characters move faster. Uh, that was pretty, yeah, pretty intuitive right away because I knew that, that right click and left click both were able to move Falonese or Rosella respectively. So uh, yeah, just clicking just came naturally. It would be a one, two click on the mouse over and over and over again. But there were some challenges. Even if you use the plus button, the game constantly resets the character's speed. The game will just randomly slow down. You just feel it all the time. So you either need to spam the plus button or hold it down for pretty much the whole run, which by the way, is about an hour long. I would tap the plus button. So I was doing this the whole time, my whole space while trying to maneuver to the right spot. I personally hold it down the entire run. So the whole game is literally just mashing left and right, left and right, which for me, I don't even do it like that. I do it like this, two fingers while holding this plus with my pinky. <laughs> it's in a very uncomfortable position. It was probably gonna end up giving me RSI later on in life. And you know, you gotta save those frames, man. That's speed running. Jam also started to finesse the character movement. Well, let me give you an example. If you click directly on the exit here, the game takes over and Valenice moves slowly. But if you click somewhere near it, Valenice moves quickly and then you can exit once you get close enough. Now, multiply that thinking across the entire game, because it doesn't happen with every animation, so you have to memorize when it happens and when it doesn't. You're essentially putting a lasso over your character's neck and saying, come here, we're going over here, and you want to walk slowly over here, mm -mm, come heal, heal girl. And if that wasn't enough, the game can also be unstable. If you're just mashing the buttons, which we do to uh, make the characters move faster, the game might crash. That's just something you had to be aware of throughout the whole entire run. And <laughs> so much of it is just a lot of annoyances. It's a lot of the game fighting against you because it doesn't want to be speed ran. With those challenges ahead of him, Jam Evil started doing runs. He quickly got his time down to 59.45. He would then be joined by another runner, someone who would become a rival, and a friend. King's Quest 7 was the first game that I officially followed on Twitch. I didn't know that you could follow games specifically. And that's how I actually found Julian Rico. And I was like, oh, cool, you like King's Quest 7. I played it as a child. I grew up with it. Here in Germany, back in the days, there were magazines with free games in it. Someday my, my father bought me a magazine and King's Quest 7 was in it. I, I would say it, it is my favorite favorite game of all time because it, it feels so it feels special everyone should uh, have played this at least once sadly my father died in 2016 from cancer and i discovered ajdq because i, I was so angry I, I want to do something about this cancer shit and um they raised money for cancer then i i thought hmm i can search for some games i played with my father together as a child. I was talking to him, he's like, yeah, I would love to speed run this game. I noticed some weird things in his run. So he doesn't do the tornado trick and um, some things. Uh, and I, I thought to myself, I can do this better. I can do this faster. One of Julian's improvements was knowing about an alternate solution to a chapter one puzzle. There's a wandering ghost in the desert named Colin Farwalker. You can get him some fresh water, and in return, he takes you to his remains where you can pick up some items. This is a very, very annoying part. You have um, Valenice, she has to get water from the salt uh, pool. 
then she have to cry in the bowl and then hey, you have to grab some corn and then magically the water is drinkable and then you can get to the thirsty man and give him something to drink and then he leads you to a tornado where his body lies on the ground his skeleton and he pushes the tornado away it looks like you can't get past the tornado without Colin, but you can actually wait a moment and just grab this horn. Because of the alternate solution, you don't need the other items. With that and a few other route improvements, Julian would start running the game. We've been t talking and working on the game for maybe a, a month or so, and he starts getting a faster time than me. I think it took me five tries or so, and then I beat his uh, his his record. And I'm like, okay, great, competition, let's go, and I'm I'm back in the game. And then a long time, it was only Jem and I beating each other. I get maybe a few seconds faster than his time. He'd get a few seconds faster than my time. He texted me one one night. I was asleep here in Germany. This time schedule is different. Uh, I got the new world record and I look at my phone and he said, oh no, I have to grind some more to beat him now. And he would find a cool little trick that saved some time or a different routing option. It was little things here and there that added up to be so many different things in the long run. One of the more interesting discoveries was a skip across the main hall in Chapter 2. Coming out of the blacksmiths, if you rapidly click through the screen transition in the right spot, you'll instantly warp to the other side. Being able to zip from one side of the cave to another on one specific screen without having to walk it, that was amazing and mind-blowing at the time. I didn't, We didn't know how we were doing it, but we were just doing it. It was just tap as fast as you can. If you blink, you miss it. Another one was the, you know, speeding up the animation of this melting spoon. We called it Fast Spoon. There's a part in Chapter 2 where Rosella needs to cool a hot metal spoon. Oh, by the way, during this chapter she's been turned into a troll, that's why she looks different. Normally this animation is very slow. Yes! But if you time it so that you cool the spoon when the fire is burning down, Rosella gets a little extra energy. Just put the spoon into the bucket at the right frame. It just causes the spoon to go faster for whatever reason. We didn't know why, we were just doing it. Uh, <laughs> With these improvements and other small reroutes, Jam and Julian would continue to bring the record down, despite the janky movement and the punishing. Oh, that's right. We haven't talked about the RNG. Oh, no. Chapter 4 is where the RNG hell starts to ensue. You end up running into what is essentially Bart Simpson and Alfalfa from the Little Rascals, where you had to break into their pumpkin that's up there, and there's this big cobweb in front of it where this giant spider will come down and eat you if you try to get, if you get caught in its web. And there's an RNG chance every time you cycle the screen back and forth that this bucket will come down. Whether it's there or not, it's a 50-50 chance every time you go on the screen. So you can have a 50-50 shot of taking the elevator and advancing the storyline or having to reset the screen. We call it Pampkin, please. I've heard, I've heard Pankin. They, uh, I've heard, uh, I, I like, I like Pampkin. There's no reason to hide it. I just, you get silly after hours and hours of nonsensical gaming, point and click adventure, speed, <laughs> speed running. In the same chapter, players need to dig down into the Boogeyman's home, but the Boogeyman is not exactly the nicest character. There is a stick there that's in front of Boogie's place, and if it's up... <coughs> Boogie's home. You don't want to go in there. Gotcha. <laughs> if it's down, Boogie's not home. So we want to Boogie down. We don't want to Boogie up. We want to Boogie down. Again, another 50-50 shot. You have to go reset the screen each time. Another more time loss. After that, we have Cuddles to deal with. <laughs> That's Malicia's dog. We need to break into Malicia's house, which is something Cuddles apparently doesn't like. If you try to go into Malicia's house with the dogs yapping... <gasps> oh, it's a nasty little termite. Uh, she'll kill you. That darn little dog. Except the RNG isn't set on this screen. It's set when you enter the previous screen. So to cycle the RNG, you have to go through four screen transitions. And it ends up costing at least, I think, 
three or four seconds per bad RNG. Yeah, it's it's a pain. But at least after that, it's over, right? Guess what? You have to do pumpkin and dog twice in this game. <laughs> yes, in Chapter 5, Valanice has to wait for the pumpkin and dog, just like her daughter. So you have to run through that whole RNG gauntlet again in Chapter 5, which is annoying, but at least Valanice doesn't have to do boogie, because that would really, really suck. But okay, we're done now, right? The worst one, however... The absolute worst one is the horse RNG in chapter five, the final nail in the in the speed run coffin of Case West Seven. Sirocco, the wind spirit. He's a he's a lovely horse, beautiful. Right at the end of the game, after you've saved the lady Mab, she gives you a bridle. You're supposed to catch the wind spirit and ride it up to talk to the king and queen of Etheria. So when you get to the top of this mountain, you have to wait for Sirocco. And how long you have to wait is random. We've seen as low as eight point not seconds and 40 something seconds of just sitting there waiting. Sirocco, the eater of runs. He is a vengeful god. He does not care if you're two minutes ahead of world record. It doesn't bother him. He will gobble that up. And you'll be on world record pace, and you'll just be like, Oh, again, huh? Oh, look at that. I just went from gold to green to red. Oh, man. Glad I just spent another 50 minutes of my life doing this. When you hit Sirocco, there's like four or five minutes left. That's it. You've just spent like an hour running this game just to have it crash and burn at the end. Disheartening, dude. Awful. That's why I hate Sirocco, and that's why he, he's no friend of mine. Eventually, Julian would get his time down to a 55-18, but the RNG was starting to discourage him from pushing it any further. I did multiple runs, 10 runs a day, and every time the dog ruins my run, the, that was very frustrating. And then, on February 8th, 2018, Jam would get this run. By this time, he had found another use for the zip across the main hall in Chapter 2. At the end of Chapter 2, Malisha shows up one last time and you have to scare her with mouse and stuff. There's an unskippable sequence that takes about 25 seconds. Or so it would seem. You can actually skip this by walking back over to the blacksmith and performing the zip we discussed earlier. Got it. Jam then got ready for the RNG gauntlet. Good elevator, good elevator, good elevator. Nope. Boogie down. Yes. Good dog, good dog, good dog, good dog. <laughs> Second try ain't bad. Come on. Wow. Four. Four is bad. No dog. Please, horse, please. Okay, we can deal with this. Holy crap, is this the sub-55? Is this the sub-55? Woo! That's the sub-55. Jam's 54-54 would be his last world record before a new crop of runners entered the scene. It feels like... You know, Julian and I were kind of pioneers of King's Quest 7 speedrunning. And though we may not have found everything, we paved at least a little bit of the way to let others take the reins. And, and they definitely did. So I'm super happy about it. And the names of those runners? Lumophile, Urquan, and Chuck Grody. Chuck Grody is an entertainer, hands down. Chuck is always in good spirits, uh, even if he doesn't sound like it. <laughs> he is always willing to share the information that he learns. He's always willing to learn more and test. And he's been a strong community leader now for a very long time. He was just someone who was an enthusiast who became one of the best point and click adventure speedrunners of all time now. I, mean, I just like the camaraderie of a jam. Honestly, he's a cool guy. Casually, I love this game. I could see potential in it becoming a cool speedrun. In August, Chuck figured out a consistent way to skip a screen in the Chapter 1 desert. After you grab the horn, there's a chance Colin Farwalker will show up on your way back north. If you hit the screen transition while Colin is still present, you'll skip the next desert screen. 
Because of the way the cursor flashes, it seems like this works because the game confuses Colin's screen exit with one of your own. We had both hit it accidentally. He was able to find a way to hit it almost every time if Colin had appeared on that screen. And if that wasn't impressive enough, Chuck also found a faster way to do Malicia skip. What I came across was that if you open up the menu for a second or save it and then close it and then click on the trail bridge screen, you just teleport over there. Fortunately, it skips a pretty long little puzzle and a lot of scenes and a lot of stuff you just can't skip, like Rosella's laughing. <laughs> and now we come upon September 2nd, 2018, arguably the most important day in all of King's Quest 7 speedrunning. Chuck was running the game and things were going well. When Chuck got to the dog in Chapter 5, he was 25 seconds ahead of his personal best. No! <laughs> Chuck is, is always in good spirits, uh, even if he doesn't sound like it. Oh, I knew it! Chuck accidentally clicked on the hole after Cuddles had barked. This meant not only a death, but a slow death. Oh, there goes this run. Rip. Done. Game over. I'm just gonna quit. Wow. Wow. Despite those words, he kept pushing. The only RNG left, after all, was the horse. Oh! That amazing Sirocco RNG would give Chuck the world record. Are we tied? No, no, you were 54... 54? Yeah, 54-45, good game. Chuck concluded his run with something that had now been unofficially codified in the rules. You know, the best part about running King's Quest Seven is finishing up a run, doesn't matter what the time is, and getting to hear the wonderful song and getting able to sing along at the end. By the way, if you're going to kind of learn to speed run this game and get a world record, or even a PB, you have to sing that song. I will not approve your run. Neither will Jam, neither will any of the mods. Written in the rules. But I guess there was some delay between the game audio and Chuck's mic or something that day. So, I'm sorry, this is going to sound a little weird. Go up, young lady. That's what they all say. It's time to settle down. Oh, child, this thing's away. Aren't you happy? The best record that I got for King's Quest Seven was when I bopped Jam off of the world record point. Whenever you do that in any community, it kind of cements you as like a real runner. Then, just a few hours later, Jam Evil would be running the game when this happened. Um. Whoa! Did something cool. I'm doing something cool. What was that? What was that? What? <laughs> oh, this better be a world record. With a good chapter five and six, this run would beat the record Chuck earned just a few hours earlier by five seconds. Yes. Chuck Grody would then investigate jams out of bounds, leading to another clip going the opposite direction. This one was more difficult, however, and inconsistent to pull off. Chuck found more places to go out of bounds in Chapter 3, but these were unhelpful as the game didn't transition to the next screen. But then, Chuck would find a setup to skip the troll over the lava bridge. When we're in um, Chapter 2 with Rosella, there's a bridge that leads over to the Dragon's Crystal Cave. The troll pops out, we try to cross it. If you walk up to him too many times, he picks her up and throws her in the lava. <laughs> supposed to do is there's a wagon up there you gotta repair it with this shield and a spike that you find in the throne room you ride it down and knock him into lava <laughs> what was discovered is that you can go out of bounds across the background of the screen to avoid him what i do when i come here is i immediately start mashing on that black dot right there you want her to actually start be looking to the wall so, and then i slow the game down about three three times, and you do that by hitting minus. I position the mouse about in this relative area, and I start mashing. 
and that'll cause Rosella to hit this point right here and then turn left and go up and off the screen. You can also do a different out of bounds to avoid the troll on the way back. All right, got around the troll. A day later, Jam would use these out of bounds to get a much faster chapter two time and a new world record of 5356. The new tech helped, of course, but the game's RNG was still king. And nowhere better could this be found than in a run by Lumophile. Lumophile is one of the hardest working and dedicated speedrunners I've ever seen. He had consistent gameplay every single time. He was the first of his kind who would grind runs over and over and over again. Reset after reset. On September 19th, Lumo was on a great paced run going into the end game. As with so many runs before, he climbed the mountain to bridle the horse. Jam's world record set just a few days before had a 36 second wait for Sirocco. Could Lumo do any better? Pretty please? Hmm. Oh, 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 Ultimately, Lumophile did not get a new world record that day, though he did get close with a new personal best of 5407. This incident also introduced new game terminology for excellent horse RNG. There's, you know, fast horse, god horse, and then a Lumo horse, which is just essentially instant. There were not just like one time, but like a couple, a few times maybe where the horse was just like right there. And I mean, it it just gave me these runs for free. There was just one thing wrong with Lumo's run, something that made the moderators question its authenticity. I uh, broke the rules according to Jam. I, I did not sing on a PB. Uh, I was, I was a, Degenerate, a rule breaker, I was bad. Despite this, the mods allowed it, and the runs continued. A week later, Jam would get a great early game and a fast horse, though not a Lumo horse. It was enough to drop the record to 5312. Things were going great for world record activity, but as sometimes happens, not everyone was satisfied with the new developments in the run. I thought to myself, okay, let's get back into the speedrunning thing, and I saw the new glitch, and I thought to myself, no, I, I, I don't think I want to get into this again. The RNG thing, the new tactics, it doesn't felt right. I, I can't explain this to you better. I love everything about this game. The magic is going away with this, with this trick, I, I thought to myself. And I was not in the mood to do new runs with this trick. I, I don't know. I, I don't know why. It, it doesn't feel right anymore. With Julian out and the 53 minute barrier so close, it was time for a new challenger to step up. Urquan is a machine. He is a machine. He really is. He's he is so consistent. Uh, he's really good at researching and finding out the best possible, most optimized way of doing things. And Urquan is able to push that to the absolute limit. He is always top tier with whatever he does. By this point, Urquan had already achieved world records in King's Quest V and King's Quest VI, and now it was time for King's Quest VII. He told me in DMs plenty of times, I don't like this game at all, <laughs> but I'm gonna get the world record. So I was like, I believe you, dude. <laughs> he had actually gone, I believe, on a GameFAQ guides and found a number of things that sped the run up, um, primarily in chapter four. There are two ways to approach the boogeyman's screen, from the top or from the right. If you approach from the top, Rosella is very quick to walk on the screen. If you come from the right, you have to watch a long cutscene with a cat the first time that you do it. But if you get bad RNG, you have to cycle the screen. Walking off to the top is slower than resetting the screen to the right. Since Urquan was grinding for world record and would reset on bad RNG anyway, he went for the riskier strat. Every time you have to reset the screen, I want to say it's like seven or eight seconds lost for every boogie you don't get. Also in chapter one, he had rerouted giving the, the seed for the bead. 
The usual route in Chapter 1 has you doing this. Get a corn kernel from inside this basket. Plant the seed to get a full ear of corn, leave the screen, come back, grab a gourd seed, and then trade the seed with the kangaroo rat for the bead. You need the green bead to proceed in the next deed. But because of the alternate Chapter 1 route, runners don't need the ear of corn. So... We already have a seed. Why don't we just give it to the kangaroo rat and get the bead? Urquan continued through the rest of the game, making small but important adjustments. He analyzed it, rerouted it, optimized his new route, and of course smashed the world record. Urquan didn't break the 53-minute barrier. He broke the 51-minute barrier. Curiously, this world record was the only run Urquan ever submitted to the leaderboards. Uh, well, see, what happened was that he probably recorded about 1,200 attempts of it and then went into DaVinci Resolve and cut them together like this cheating bastard that he is. <sighs> Maybe, but more likely, Urquan was just the kind of runner who wouldn't accept anything less than perfection. He ran a lot, but he would only submit what he thought was great. He really didn't stream a whole lot, and I think that's why some people were suspicious of him, because, I mean, obviously he has fantastic precision. Chuck Grody and Lumophile would keep lowering their times into the spring of 2019. Lumophile's run on April 9th would be his final personal best. I kind of felt like I was a part of, like, the revitalization of Seven. There was some Seven being done for, like, about a year straight. Jam was in like every one of those streams because that's like his game. Like, he loves Seven. It's definitely like that feel that you look for in like a really big game community where you have like a lot of this competition, but it was really only like four of us. So it was, it was kind of cool because it was, it was almost like a brotherhood. On June 7th, 2019, Lumophile would run the King's Quest Collection at the North American Speedrunner Assembly Marathon. The King's Quest Collection is a run of all seven all seven games in a row. And after that, Lumophile would retire from King's Quest speedrunning. Ultimately, he won the battle against the RNG and, and retired happily from King's Quest 7. With Lumophile gone, what about Urquan? Well, in March of 2019, after many impressive King's Quest world records, Urquan disappeared. We've tried to get in touch with him, but with no success. To this day, we still don't know what happened to him. But wherever he is... I wish him well. So, of the three newcomers, that left Chuck Grody. He continued his King's Quest VII grind, still chasing Urquan's world record. And on August 19th, 2019, he got this run. At the end of Chapter 1, he was neck and neck with Urquan. He maintained pace through Chapter 2, being less than a second behind. Going into Chapter 4, Chuck had gained some time and was now a few seconds ahead. There's what all comes tumbling down. Pampkin, please. Thank you, Pampkin. Oh, we boogied down. So far, so good. <gasps> All right. Things were neck and neck, but there's something I haven't told you. There's a section where you use a dream catcher and have two nightmares fight against each other. If you accidentally hold the plus button through that, you die. And Urquan, in his world record, had an unintentional death. This meant Chuck was already eight seconds ahead going into Sirocco. <gasps> All right. Not a god horse, but a fast enough horse. Enough for Chuck to take home a 50-38 and snag the crown from Urquan. Mm, the curse of Quan has been broken. A year later, Chuck would get back at it. A 50-26, and then a 50-12. 14 seconds. Not bad. The summer of 2020 also saw the entrance of another runner. He originally went by the name Top Keck Shrek, but has since renamed himself Retro TKS, so that's what I'm going to be calling him. All the pieces came into place. It was just like, my car was dead. I couldn't go anywhere. The only thing I had left to do was sit at home all day and play video games. King's Quest VII was not a likely candidate for TKS to start running. So I hated this game when I first played it casually. I thought it was stupid. He began instead with King's Quest VI. He quickly got world record by July. 
He kept grinding, getting better and better records, but soon burnt out. It was time for a change. This was a breath of fresh air. Like running this game, I was like, I can relax. I can loosen the belt a little bit. It's not super ridiculously technical. I have time to breathe. I have time to think. I can plan what's coming next. And the more I played it, and the more I learned about it, man, it's my favorite King's Quest game to run now. Retro TKS learned the game quickly. Soon, he was getting times rivaling jams. Love TKS. Someone who has the grindy aspects of Lumophile has the entertainment aspects of Chuck Grody. He sings during his run. He plays music during his run. That's all that matters. I don't care about the speed run anymore. Entertain me. And that's it. Then TKS did something monumental that would forever change the way runners looked at the game. There's a little tune that plays during chapter three as Val is walking up and down the stairs in the crazy castle, I like to call it. It's like an MC Escher painting. She's walking through the staircases. And it's got a really catchy tune. And so I just thought I'll make up some words to go over it. He apparently wrote some like song to the tune of it about hot dogs or hot dog water, or something like that. I eat a hot dog every day. Sometimes I eat two or three hot dogs. But that's really none of your business. I heard him singing it, and I was kind of like thinking in my mind, and no offense, Shrek. It's kind of lame. Now, to understand this next part, you need to know three things. Number one, the community would often have races around this time, friendly competitions to see who could get the best time. Number two, the game, and series, was created by Roberta Williams. We sometimes call her Berta for short. And number three, Franzia is a popular brand of boxed wine. During one of our uh, races, I think I was just like asked randomly, anybody else think that Berta is kind of like a wine ant? You know, she just kind of like sits on her boat, has her giant projector, and she's sitting here watching our speed runs and just pounding back boxes of Franzia while getting really pissed off and sh posting on the internet or whatever, just complaining about us beating our game so fast. We then changed the hot dog song to Berta drinking Franzia. I drink my Franzia every day. I drink a box or two a day. Sometimes I have three, sometimes I have four. And then I piss all over myself. Kenny! There are some ground rules for the Franzia song. The exact number of Franzia boxes that Berta drinks is unknown. That's up to you. You ad lib how many boxes she drinks. I like to say one to three. It's also customary to improvise two things. One is what Berta gets up to after she drinks too much Franzia. She may piss all over herself. She may throw up in her mouth. She may sh So she does a number of different things as she continues to imbibe. And then the other thing to improvise is what Berta is going to yell at Ken Williams in order to rectify uh, the aforementioned shenanigans. So he may grab the Swiffer. He may get the wet naps. He could put the couch over the stain on the rug. He also does something to solve the crisis. As long as you satisfy all these uh, ground rules for the Ranger song, you are free to run the game. I mean, I I love me some good box wine. Franzi has stores well on, on ships, on long voyages. You don't need a cup. You could just drink it out of the bag. You could... <laughs> I wanted to explore the power of the Franzia song on a deeper level. I wanted to know what advantage this supreme alpha ninja strat would bestow upon those skilled enough to wield it. So the easy thing to do would be crack open Excel, put in the runs, see which ones had the Franzia song, which ones didn't, ignore the difference between correlation and causation, and take an average between the two. But I am not a smart man. So, I found a new fancy web framework and a backend as a service I had never used before. I installed everything in minutes and then spent the next two hours in incompatible dependency hell before giving up and going back to the old fancy web framework I was familiar with. But that wasn't all, <laughs> no. I scrubbed through every run and found the timestamp of when the singing happens. Each row in this table has a link so you can compare the variations and, oh yeah, I don't think I mentioned, 
both characters have to go through this room at different points, so you've got two timestamped links. No, never mind, may as well throw in a link to when the runner sings along with the end credits. And all this to show that, yes, singing the Franzia song saves you an incredible amount of time, but not really, but yes, really, and the link to this masterpiece is in the description. So, back to where we were in the summer of 2020. The power of the Franzia song enabled Chuck to drop the record to 50.09. The 50-minute barrier was tantalizingly close, but even the Franzia couldn't completely overcome the brutal RNG. I hit a burnout phase with trying to get the record that sub-50. No, oh, f this game, dude. And in our conversation, Chuck told me about a run that very nearly broke him. It was a run where I essentially got 100% perfect RNG. The whole thing, across the board. First try Pampkin, first try Boogie, two first tries of Cuddles, everything. It all lined up. And I got one of the worst horses I ever got in my life. And I remember at the end of the run, I hit the final thing and I went like this. Because I was just flabbergasted. I'm like, how could you give me everything? And then just, it's like, it's the Michael and Michelangelo painting, the two fingers of featuring God, and you just fall through the chute down to hell. <laughs> Try again, sucker. <laughs> you ain't winning this one. Because of this, Chuck would take a long break from King's Quest 7 speedrunning. And then, in June of 2021, several runners had a King's Quest 7 race. They got to talking about how close the game was to sub 50. And so, Chuck and TKS vowed to compete to be the first. We were all convinced Chuck was going to get a first because he knew the game better than any one of us, and he was just throwing so many runs at it. So obviously we all thought, if anyone's going to get a sub-50, it's got to be Chuck. Just seeing it back and forth between Chuck and TKS and Chuck and TKS, it was just super exciting. Until June 23rd, 2021, when Retro TKS got this run. First buggy? Nope. Hello, doggy. One doggy. <laughs> oh yeah! We did it! We did it! <laughs> Some 50, baby! The RNG had been pretty average, but it was average throughout the whole run and none of it was bad. It was good enough, and Shrek was also just that good. Grow up, young lady, that's what they all say. It's time to settle down. I am surprised I was the first one to get sub-50, because that was the goal for the longest time. I didn't end up getting it. Shrek got it, and I'm, hey, I'm glad he did. I will admit I was a little bitter about that. <laughs> But that, that was really fun because we were just like just talking back and forth about the game and that and that was the big thing is that it opens dialogue up about the game it allows me to talk to all these cool people about a game that i love two days later chuck wouldn't get a new world record but he would drop his time to 5004 yep from there retro tks would take a break and then return in february of 2022 the last world record, if you recall, had merely average RNG. Would he be able to change that? On February 25th, he got a run with a great start. Sometimes I have one, sometimes I have nine. But then I pee all over myself. Can he did it again? He was about 20 seconds ahead when he got to this screen to grab the ambrosia on the end of the branch. And there's something I haven't mentioned yet. No, no, no. Sirocco can show up early and knock you off the branch. I lost like 10 seconds because of that. I was like, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it, buddy. Sir. That is much salt. Much salt. What a run. What a run. The RNG was perfect. 
Like, if anyone's going to beat this time, it's got to be for execution alone. I mean, okay. The horse was 19 seconds. That's not super fast. Yeah, the horse knocked me off the branch. I forgot about that. That's true. And that would be it for King's Quest Seven world record activity. For a while. But on the horizon, a new member was on his way up. So when I was little, it was mainly my dad that kind of inspired everything. The earliest I can remember was King's Quest Three. you know, Gwydion and then an Alexander. You know, I specifically remember Manan and the Wizard. Um, and then, you know, he just got every King's Quest from there. And as he would play them, if I was able, I'd sit right next to him and just, you know, oh, yeah, this is so cool. Like, yeah. And then he eventually got to seven. The first game Admiral J would run would actually be Space Quest Six. This was a game also run by Retro TKS. I don't know how anyone's going to take this. I credit myself for getting Jay into the King's Quest series because I beat a Space Quest Six run, okay? He had done one run like a year before and had not done any runs after that. So I was just like, I'm going to tackle this game. I beat his time. All of a sudden he's back and he's running and he's doing all these other games and he became like a really valuable member of the community. And I was like, that's that's me, dude. I'm taking credit for that, okay? I don't care what anyone says. I don't even care what Jay says about it. I'm saying that that's a fact. But instead of King's Quest Seven, Jay would start with a different King's Quest. I, I gravitate more towards the point and clicks, you know, so I played five and then four retold. Quick plug here for King's Quest IV Retold. It's a fan-made version of the game with a lot of quality of life updates like autosaves, the ability to turn dead ends off, and it removes the parser completely in favor of point-and-click icons. If you haven't played King's Quest IV, or even if you haven't played it in a while, this is the way I recommend playing. Okay, back to talking about Admiral J. He's very talented. He, he beat this, the King's Quest V record in no time flat. Like, it was like a couple runs later he had the record. I was like, damn, dude. Like, that, that's, he has a lot of skill. By June of 2022, Admiral J was running King's Quest VII and progressing quickly. Uh, Admiral J came out of nowhere. He started working on the game, learned all the strats really fast, and just started working down that time. Very admirable. He's an admirable J. I'm I'm sorry, YouTube. <laughs> there weren't any huge time saves discovered, but Jay was disciplined and put in the practice. During work, you know, this being my office, I have my personal computer and I also have my work computer directly over here. And during the day, we get to 15 minute breaks and we get a lunch. So, you know what I do on my 15 minute break? I'll change the input and maybe I'll run a chapter three just to see how one of those go. Maybe I can get Valenice a little bit quicker. And on June 27th, he would get his first world record. Oh, man. Oh, I should have gone dead girl with that one. Jay had broken the 49-minute barrier. But what was this dead girl? Edgar is from King's Quest IV. That's Edgar here at the end of King's Quest IV asking to marry Rosella. She turns him down even though the game describes him as a hunk. And then he comes back in seven as having been manipulated and transformed and playing a fake king. Edgar? But at the very end, you have two choices. Because Malicia has killed him at that point. So you can either save him with an extra life from a cat that you've gotten earlier in the game, one of their nine lives, the cat gives it to you. Or you can just sit there and Edgar's spirit just bloop, 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 and then Edgar's gone forever and then we disappoint Rosella because then she doesn't live happily ever after. If you know the run is not going to be a record or a PB, it's kind of almost revenge towards the game. Like, hey, you, you kind of threw me under the bus with the RNG, so guess what I'm gonna do? Edgar is dying today. It doesn't require any input on the player's part. You just have to wait. In other words, Deadger meant taking an intentional time loss. So, having already gotten a world record, Jay promised that if he could pull it off and still get another world record, he would do it. A week later, Jay found himself on another fast pace. He had a better Chapter 4 and a slightly faster horse. Things were looking promising, but it was too close. Yeah, I can't do Deadger. Damn it. <clears throat> Jay, however, was not one to give up. And on July 8th, 2022, one night before our scheduled interview, Jay got this run. 
we will appeal to the ultimate higher power for this game. We'll appeal to Berta. Ooh, look at that. Sometimes I have three, sometimes I have five. And then I pass out on the couch. Kenny, grab the smelling salts. I drink my frangia every day. Oh! Ooh. Oh! I almost hit the door there, too. As <laughs> on the edge of my yacht. Well, thanks, Berta. 49 on the screen. Here we go. 49. 10. 15, 20, 25, we're still doing okay, yep, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing Dedger, and still getting the record, <laughs> oh man. Jay had done it. It had all paid off. The training, the grind, the singing. Before last night, I would have said that Franja was less important to success. But last night I I sang all the Franges and now now I'm a believer. So, with the runs finished and Rosella with her unhappy ending, there's only one thing left to do. Grow up, young lady. That's what they all say. It's time to settle down. Put childish things away. Aren't you happy, thrilled, delighted? You're going to be a bride. Yes, I'm so excited. I want to run and hide. I want to go to a land beyond dreams where everything's new. Not really what it seems. Enchantment adventures are waiting for me. I'll find that magic land. A land beyond dreams. Scene. Fresh to dust. Fresh to dust.